Praise the Lord. Good morning, everyone. Oh, thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, happy Mother's Day to all those who are mothers in the room. Let's give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> You know, uh, I was very blessed to have an, uh, a wonderful earthly mother who's gone home to be with the Lord. A few years ago, some of you have had the pleasure of meeting her. And yet, I was thinking and just reminiscing about Mother's Day today and uh, how some of the things that my mom did growing up that I recognized that even, uh, let's say, you know, maybe you don't have uh, natural children of your own. In, in our case, my mom did. She had five of us. <laughs> And yet, my mom reached out to, to many people, and as I grew up, and she would, she would just bless them and minister to them. And my mom had a way of sort of, um, I don't know, sort of identifying or picking up on the people that were maybe not as popular, not as this, not as that, you know, and she would just, she would just love them, and she would encourage them. She just had a very gentleness about her, and I remember growing up that they would come over to our house. She would invite uh, other young ladies to come over to our house that, you know, maybe didn't have a mom or um, didn't have very much money. And she would end up, my mom wasn't a beautician by trade, but she would wash their hair. She would style their hair. She would, uh, back in the day, give them uh, perms in their hair and, and do their nails. And it's just little things that she would do just to truly minister to the heart uh, of those young ladies and, and young people back in the day. And those relationships that she developed with those um, people oftentimes lasted a lifetime. And, uh, you know, I just want to encourage you that, you know, even if you didn't have, if you do or you don't have children of your own, you can still really play a very, very important role in, in the lives of other people. Praise God. So just... Uh, so grateful for, for moms and uh, for the, um, with the example that a good, godly mom can leave to us uh, as children and uh, my wife as an example of uh, what a godly mom is to her children, and it's just such a blessing. Love you and thank you so much. Appreciate you. Praise God, yes. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. We're so glad you're here. I know that you're going to be blessed um, teaching in this series entitled Keep Your Eyes on Jesus. And in this series, the last few weeks, I've been specifically kind of zeroing in on the rest, this rest, and this entering into this rest. And you may have heard something like this. You may have heard me minister on this before in some capacity, but let's not Let's not just sit here and go, oh, yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that, heard that, and then go back to our life the way we live tomorrow or even later today. Let's literally let this Word of God uh, penetrate into our hearts and let it uh, begin to change our life and renew our mind to what the Word of God says. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you, Father, for your Word. So we open our heart and our minds to hear and to receive of you. Lord, I pray, as the Apostle Paul said, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened. Lord, that we would see things that perhaps we've not seen before. We would be reminded and see things that we've seen before. And Lord, that we would walk and live by faith. And Lord, that we would enter into this rest that is, that is exemplified in your word through, through those who have done this, uh, who have experienced this, who've shown us a way and that we would just receive it, grab a hold of it for our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you have your Bible, go to Hebrews 4.1, please. And I'm going to begin reading here in Hebrews 4, and I'm going to hopefully get to some things that, uh, that I haven't got to. I'm going to do a little bit of review. Uh, for those of you who perhaps didn't, weren't here, I didn't hear all of this, a little bit of review, and then we're going to get all into this. But Hebrews 4.1, I'm, I'm going to begin reading this in the New Living. Now, typically, I'll use King James translation, but I also like to use New Living translation, and I also use the, uh, the classic Amplified also. Um, I'll, I like to read, I, I, you know, in my study time, 
Uh, occasionally, I'll look at like the message, uh, which, you know, eh, sometimes that's kind of fun to read, and sometimes it's not exactly that accurate. Um, but you can look at, um, you know, the, the Young's literal translation is a really good one. Uh, there's some, just j- some different Jewish translations that are really cool. And so I just want to encourage you, today, with today's Bible apps, it's just really amazing how you can look at m- multiple different uh, translations. And really, the whole purpose of why I do this and why I minister that way is so I can do the best I can to convey to you what God is saying through his word. Amen? Ultimately, that's what we all want to hear, right? So it says that God's promise of entering his rest still stands. Praise God. So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Verse 2 says, for this good news that God has prepared this rest, that God has prepared this rest, amen, has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did them no good because they didn't share the faith of those who listened to God. Verse 3 says, for only we who believe can enter his rest. Say that with me. For only we who believe can enter his rest. Now, uh, you can go home and read all this, read down through this at home. But for, for time purposes, let's jump down to verse 6 again. It says, so God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter it because they disobeyed God. They failed to enter it. How, why? Because they disobeyed God. And we'll look at that a little bit later. So God set another time for entering his rest, and that time is today. Folks, it's time for us to enter into this rest. Amen? Again, this, this, this might be one of the most overlooked benefits of being a child of God. As a Christian, we have this great benefit of while we live on this earth, we can still live at rest. There is a rest that we enter into, and we'll look at how we enter into this. We enter into this by faith. Remember, he says, only we who believe can enter his rest. This rest is available for you and I. Now, we believe Our believing literally affects every aspect of our life, if you think about it. And our believing affects our physical makeup, our our, our physicality, what we believe. I mean, let's just take the reverse of, 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 of something that if you believe in something's ability to harm you, we would call that fear, right? If you believe in... God's word, which the Bible says the faith words nourish, we're looking at uh, at that on Thursday, right? Then we believe in the, the blessing of God, on and on and on, right? So what we believe literally affects us in the physical sense. Our physical body, our believing is affected by that. And he says, we who believe can enter into this rest. Now this rest is so important for our life. Praise God that we have a heavenly father and our heavenly father knows that we need something to believe in. And what we have to believe in is solid. It's a foundation. It's it's the the Bible calls it an anchor to our soul. In fact, go over there, just go down to Hebrews chapter 6 and let's look at this just for a minute. Hebrews 6 in verse 17, it says, accordingly, God also, in his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promises, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan, intervened, meditated with an oath. This was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might 
have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. Verse 19, now we have this hope. Say that with me. Now we have this hope. He says, as a sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. A sure and steadfast anchor of our soul. Now, you've heard me teach and preach on this. Who you are is spirit. What you have is a soul, or you possess a soul, your mind, your will, your emotions, and you live in a physical body. You have your three-part being. And he talks about how this anchor of our soul, and when I was thinking and and reading uh, this this week, um, you think of an anchor, you think of a, a, a vessel, right? I do. And... You know, typically what you do is you sort of size the anchor to the size of the vessel. You want to hold this vessel uh, secure, then there's an ankle, an anchor that is, you know, that corresponds with the size of that boat, if you will, and design, and so forth. And at my office, outside of one of my offices, I have this anchor that is probably about four or five feet uh, tall. It's made of solid steel. It weighs. I would guess over 500 pounds at least. We had to have a crane to put it there. It was given to us by a, a friend of ours who is a uh, um, recovery diver, and he was, uh, in the 80s, he was assigned and tasked and worked for recovering of when the Skyway Bridge was struck um, uh, years, many years ago, and the items that fell to the bottom there, and he recovered this giant anchor that was in the water, and uh, you know they brought a crane to bring it up, set it on the ship, and he had it for years, and he, he gave it to us. Well, that anchor, you look at that, and you go, man, that's a <laughs> that's an anchor, <laughs> you know. I mean, things like this tall, and you know, solid steel, and about this wide, you know, and uh, you go, what in the world? That that means, man, you know, what kind of vessel is that going to hold? Well, think about that. The anchor. To our soul is Jesus Christ. And you can't get anything bigger than him. (laughs) There is nothing in this earth that can ever happen to you that the anchor of our soul can't hold us to. Can't keep us steady. I mean, the most difficult times you might face... Things may happen to you, take you off guard, take you by surprise. You don't expect it. You didn't see it coming. Yet there is an anchor that we can anchor our soul into. This this anchor is Christ Jesus. And no matter what comes, no matter what tribulations, trials, storms that you may be dealing with or faced with, I'm telling you, You can anchor your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions in him. And he will hold you steadfast in the most difficult of times. This is the hope, the hope that we as believers have. Listen, the world doesn't have, they don't know this hope. They're not anchored into this hope. And if, if you don't believe me, I mean, go read. I mean, if you, want a, if you want a downer, go read how many people commit suicide on an annual basis. It's staggering. There's a lot of attention to other causes of death, but suicide is a very real cause of death that happens in people's life. And I'm telling you, there is an answer to even suicide, and it is the anchor in which we hold our emotions, we hold our will, we hold to this anchor of hope who is Christ Jesus. You and I, we have an anchor to our soul. And this is glorious. This is wonderful. This is peace-giving. This is the rest, the rest that we can enter into. We who believe do enter into 
his rest. Amen? All right, let's, let's keep going. Go back to Hebrews chapter 4. It says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We'll say that's me. <laughs> it says, For he that entered into his rest, he hath also ceased from his own works, as God did from his. I like this here. He says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Whoa. Now, this gets a little heavy duty. <clears throat> Unrest is an example of unbelief. Worry is an example of unbelief. I'm going to go a little bit further. Don't get mad at me. Don't hate me. Being upset all the time. Being upset, period, is an example of unbelief. Anxiety is an example of unbelief. Now, I know I, I go out far. I know not everybody's going to agree with that last statement. But I'm here to help you. I'm not here to cast judgment. I'm not here to analyze whatever diagnosis or whatever you may be dealing with. I'm here to preach to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm here to help you, to tell you, and to teach you how that even anxiety, you, 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 this entering into this rest, this place of rest is a place that is free of anxiety. How you leave a state of anxiety is by entering into his rest. And I'm going to teach you how to do that, okay? All right, praise God. Let me keep reading here. Well, I'm going to read real quick in the Amplified Bible of this same, Hebrews 4.11. It says, Let us therefore be zealous and exert ourselves and strive diligently to enter that rest of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, that no one may fall or perish by the same kind of unbelief and disobedience into which those in the wilderness fell. Now, ultimately, <clears throat> we're failing to not enter into his rest because of unbelief. Now, hold your place there and go with me to, go to, do, uh, go to Numbers chapter 13 real quick. I, I'm, I'm going down this road again here. Numbers chapter 13, let's look at verse 1. I'll read this out of the King James. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, All right, just real quick, this may be very obvious and, and very elementary for you, but, you know, I just like to make things very simple at times. The Lord spoke, to Moses, right? Well, what are words? He didn't speak. I'm teaching and preaching to you in the English language, right? Well, I'm preaching to you and I'm conveying thoughts. When God spoke to Moses, what was God doing? God was conveying to Moses his thoughts, right? And when he's conveying his thoughts to Moses, he's telling him what his heart is. He's, he's conveying to him his desire for his people, right? Now, keep reading, it says, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. So what is he saying? I give unto you, the children of Israel, 
this land, right? He's conveying his heart and his thoughts to Moses so that Moses can lead the children of Israel into this place. Got it? Very simple, right? You everybody with me? Okay. Now, fast forward, look over further in this chapter. And it says that in verse, oh, let's look at verse 26. I know I'm just throwing stuff at you up there, guys. Thank you. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Look at verse 28. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coasts of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people. Now remember, 12 leaders went out. Ten came back. They're giving this report. And while they're giving this report, Caleb stills the people. You can see they're getting, they're getting uneasy, right? Because here he, they're, they're talking about the land. They, they begin to convey what God told uh, Moses about the land. And now they begin to put their report in this. And, and Caleb stills the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it. Say it with me. Let us go up at once and possess it. He says, for we are well able to overcome. But the men that went up with him said, we not be able to overcome, uh, go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report. What kind of report? Okay. Now, don't sit here and think, please, uh, that I'm just trying to split hairs, because I'm not. I'm trying to teach you something that I think is very valuable. The scriptures just told us what that report was called. And it was called an evil report. Now, a lot of people would say, well, it was true. I mean, the land, you notice how they did it. The land, does it flow with milk and honey? God said it flowed with milk and honey. Does it flow with milk and honey? Yes. Is it a wonderful land from the going? Yes. But all of a sudden, they begin to talk about the people. And they begin to talk about the walls. Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's true. The people are great. The walls are large. But it's interesting, the Bible doesn't call it a true report. The Bible calls it an evil report. Why is it called an evil report? It's called an evil report because what they begin to say began to go contrary to what God said. And God said that they could go in, that this was their land. And now all of a sudden fear, fear and unbelief is creating an evil report within them. And what are they doing? They're using words to convey their thoughts and what they believe. Because all of a sudden, although they know God said it's their land, because Moses told them, now all of a sudden, they're conveying their thoughts and their belief, and their belief was that they couldn't go in. All right? Now go with me to Deuteronomy, chapter 1, verse 28. It said, what we just read in Hebrews, it said, through unbelief and disobedience... 
Deuteronomy 21, 28. It says, where can we go? I'm reading New Living. Where can we go? Our brothers have demoralized us with their report. They tell us the people of the land are taller and more powerful than we are. And their towns are large with walls rising high into the skies. Even that we even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Verse 29, but I say to you, don't be shocked or afraid of them. Hmm. For the Lord your God is going ahead of you. <laughs> He's going ahead of you. Doesn't this sound reminiscent of when David faced a giant? And here Goliath stands and mocks the God of Israel. And, and he says, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And this day, this day, he will deliver me, deliver you into my hands. He, God, will deliver you into my hands. This day. When? When did Joshua and Caleb say that they were well able to go into it? Let us go up at? When can you enter into this rest? As soon as you choose to believe. Well, you know, as soon as I just get a little money, a little nest egg in the bank account. Nope, you can enter into that rest now. Well, as soon as I get all these things, as soon as I figure this out, as soon as I, as soon as I retire, as soon as this, uh, this, this investment matures, as soon as, as soon as, no. As soon as I get between two palm trees and the hammock and the temperature is just right. No, because you can be between two perfect palm trees in the perfect hammock, in the perfect weather scenario and not be at rest. And you can close your eyes and not be at rest. And you can walk around with your eyes open but, and be in rest. How you enter into this rest isn't where your physical body is. It's where your faith is. You can be in the most difficult of times, naturally speaking, and be at rest. Hmm. Let me keep reading. He says, but I say to you, don't be shocked or afraid of them. The Lord your God is going ahead of you, and he'll go ahead of you. He will fight for you just as you saw him do in Egypt. And you saw how the Lord your God cared for all, you all along the way as you traveled through the wilderness, just as a father cares for his child. Now he has brought you to this place. But even after he did, you refused to trust the Lord your God. Who goes before you looking for the best places to camp. Guiding you with a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. You see what happened is Israel feared their enemy. And their fear, not their enemy, kept them from enjoying God's best. I'm going to say that again. Israel feared their enemy. But their enemy didn't keep them from God's best. Their fear of their enemy, their unbelief, is what kept them from God's best. And the only thing stop standing between you and God's rest is your belief. You're afraid this isn't going to work out. You're afraid this is going to happen. You're afraid this might not. I don't know about this. Hey, there are a lot of uncertainties in the world. I understand that. There really are. But thank God we don't put the, the hope and the trust, the anchor of our soul isn't in anything that's earthly. It's heavenly. Amen. It's something that is bigger than the whole entire earth. In fact, all creation came out of him. 
And I like to remind people, <laughs> God is really, really, really smart. He knows you inside and out. And God knows that you need to enter into this rest. This rest he's made available for your life. He knows responsibilities you have. He knows the things you need to get done. What I've found in my life is when I enter into this rest, <laughs> that I become more efficient at what I do. I like to say it like this, supernatural efficiencies. It's like you don't know how in the world you're going to get something done, and yet you get it all done. But I find that when I'm stressing and when I'm toiling and when I'm worried and I can sense, you know, I'm starting to be anxious about this, you know, guess what? My efficiencies drop way, way down. Not to mention it affects my physical body. But I can be working. Like I said, this rest is not a, a lack of activity <laughs> because you can work and be at rest. And being at rest is not stressed. Amen. I, I've, I've shared this now a number of weeks. How do we enter into that rest is through belief, by faith. And I said, how do you know, what are, what, are the, what are the two easy indicators if you're in belief, if you're believing, if you're, if you're walking, living in faith? Two easy indicators. Number one, your joy. Number two, your peace. Those are the two easy indicators that you need to keep your eye on all the time. I got to do this on a regular basis. My joy and my peace. My joy and my peace. Because those, those are so, they're just right, sort of like really easy to identify. You say, people, are, are, you, are you in faith? Are you believing? Oh, yeah, I'm in faith. I'm in faith. We'll talk about my faith. Of course I'm in faith. Can you tell I'm in faith? Man, you mess around with people's faith, man. They, they, can get, they, get, they get touchy. Yeah, well, well where's, your, where's your peace? Where's your joy at? Because those will be real quick indicators of what's going on in your life. Right? And here, they begin to get mad. The, 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 the 12 leaders begin to get mad because here's Joshua, here's Caleb, and they're standing up going, we're well able. We're well able. We're well able. And you know, the, you know these other leaders are looking at them and going, what are you talking about, well able? Did, you, saw the same, you saw the same giants we saw. You saw the same walls I saw. What do you mean we're well able? What's well able about us? I, we are like grasshoppers in their sight. Now, now, now they're speculating <laughs> what, the, what they think about you. How many times have you ever done that? Well, I know what they think about me. I, can, I know what they're saying over there. We don't know that. Amen. And I guarantee you all that is an attempt to steal your rest. <laughs> God's best is found in his rest. God's best is found in his rest. Go to Psalm 62, 5. Remember, you can work hard, not be stressed. You can work hard, not be worried. You can work hard and stay at rest. Because you can work hard and trust God at the same time. Amen? You can work hard and be joyful. You can work hard and be peaceful. You can work hard and be happy. You can work hard and be carefree. You can work hard and you can sing praises to God while you're working hard. And I believe that that's why David, the psalmist David, is such a good example because you look at his life and you look at what he would, remember he, would, he was literally talking to his soul 
and he began to sing songs would come out of him, and he would say things like, my soul waiteth only, or wait thou only upon God. He's telling his soul, his mind, will, emotions, wait only on God, for my expectation is from him. Say, my expectation is from him. Now, this is so important. Listen, I, I'm guilty as the next person of putting our expectation on other people. And it's not that we expect nothing out of other people. Let me make it clear, okay? But if your expectation on someone begins to affect your joy, begins to affect your peace, it begins to affect, you know, so, things like that, you know, all of a sudden you better make sure that you have the right and proper and healthy expectation on that person. Oftentimes, you have an unhealthy and a false expectation on what you think they should do for you. This happens. I mean, I'm just, like I said, I'm just as guilty as the next person where this is at. But I need to, at the end of the day, I need to go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I'm, um, you know, Lord, forgive me, because I have had, I expected them to get this done. They said they were going to get this done. They committed to get this done. But ultimately, you know what? My rest and my peace and my joy should not be affected by anybody else, what they do or what they don't do for me. That's how you stay at rest. You remember, those who enter into this rest, we do this by our believing. What are we doing? Our, the hope, our hope is anchored in him. This is very practical. And, you got, you got, let's take it one more step. Even yourself, when you let yourself down. If you're hard on other people, chances are you're hard on yourself. I'm just mad at myself. I wish I would, you know, I thought I'd be further along. I thought I'd have this done by now. I shouldn't have made that decision. I shouldn't have invested in that. I shouldn't have went in business over here. I shouldn't have went there. I shouldn't have done that. Whatever, whatever. It's the same cycle. It's the same trap. Amen? That was worth coming to church. Amen? Again, this rest doesn't mean you sit around and do nothing and that now, now you're in rest. That's not what I'm talking about. I think I made that very clear. When our expectation is on the Lord, that's when we enjoy God's rest. <laughs> if you find yourself not enjoying your life, no peace, no joy, no rest, then immediately we need to look at what we're putting our trust into. Let's keep reading here. I'm going to read, uh, Psalm, I have you in Psalm 62. I'm going to read now New Living, same thing I just read in the King James. He says, let all that I am wait quietly before God. Hmm. Boy, there's a lesson in that, aren't, isn't there? Let all that I am wait quietly before God. Say that with me. Let all that I am wait quietly before God. You never notice when somebody's just, they're learning to do this? You're just kind of just stepping out in this, and you're like, okay, I'm trusting God. And you know what they want to do? They want to tell everybody that they're trusting in God. You know what I'm doing? I'm trusting in God. You know what I'm doing? I'm trusting in God. You know what I mean? Hey, you know, hey, this is going on in my life, but I'm trusting in God. No, he says, quietly. <laughs> quietly. There's a lesson to be learned in that. All right. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. For my victory and honor come from God alone. Woo. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people, trust in him 
at all times. <laughs> Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. Boy, I just fire you right up, man. You just, when you just go to the Bible and start reading it with just some faith in your heart, you know, just some faith in you, it's just like, yeah! It does me, I don't know, I just, yeah! Sometimes I just need a little of that, you know? Yeah, I mean, because you do this, and this breaks, and then this person quits, and then this person, this happens over here, and this seems like that, and you got to go back and read your Bible. Don't just be, oh, little hole that I am, wait quietly for the Lord. My hope is in him. You're my rock. You don't sound like he's your rock. <laughs> read the word of God with some faith in your heart, Amen. Go to Philippians 4, 6. Let's look at this. I think we looked at this. Let's look at it again. A few more minutes. Philippians 4, 6. Yeah. Don't worry about a thing. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Y'all know. You know that. Don't you? Hey, you're in church. You're not supposed to know that. <laughs> don't worry about anything. Say with me. Don't worry about anything. Yeah, I'm a pastor. Yeah, but this is written a long time ago. Yeah, but God probably didn't know what I was going to face, what I was going to be dealing with. No, he knew. The Bible says he knew the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. You're not catching God off guard with your problems. He knew. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Isn't this, to me, you just look at this, this is exactly what David was doing as he's sitting there facing down Goliath as a young boy. He's like, hey, 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 I killed the lion, and I killed the bear, and I'm going to kill you too. Guess what? He wasn't worried about anything. You know how I know? Because he was already asking what the prize was. He said, what does the man get that kills this guy? That tells me he wasn't worried. Hey, if you're worried, you're not thinking about what we, You're like, oh my gosh, what if, I, what if I miss him? What if he moves? What if the shield? I, know. I can't even hardly really see the guy. How much did they hit him with a rock? Are you serious, God? Right? He wasn't thinking like that. He wasn't over there with his projector and doing the, the, the mass and volume and speed and doing the math and trying to figure out the velocity of the rock and make sure he wouldn't figure any of that out. He's already asking what the guy gets that kills the giant. Well, he gets the girl and he gets a 501c3 tax exemption for the rest of his life. Right? Why? Because he had plans to take him down. But what was he doing? Well, he prayed. Number one, he wasn't worried. And he was reminding himself of previous victories. That's a good thing to do in your life. Because the enemy's constantly trying to say, oh, yeah, yeah, but not this time. Yeah, you got healed before, but not this time. Yeah, you got, you got the, uh, yeah, you got helped out of that, but you know, and then he'll throw this, that was just lucky. No, not for the child of God. We don't believe in luck, we believe in God. Yeah. Amen? So it's not a matter of that, it's a matter of trusting. And you say, no, 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 I remember, I remember, I remember, I remember. I remember one time we were years ago, close to 20 years ago, all of a sudden, I went to go to the bank, pull some money out or something like that, and my bank account was froze. What in the world? And the IRS froze our assets. Talk about an opportunity to not worry about a thing. <laughs> like, what is this? I had no, I, had, I didn't even know, I had no clue. 
And it was, they, and then we, we, we start calling when that happens. You got to come down to our office in Tampa. And I drove down there right away. I'm like, well, I don't even know what's going on. What's going on? They come in there. They bring me. They begin to interrogate me. Boy, I don't wish that upon anybody. It was craziness. It was treated so unfairly. You know, long story short, they made a mistake. You'll have plenty of opportunity to worry. You'll have plenty of opportunity to stress. Oh, and we didn't get an apology letter, in case you're wondering. <laughs> we didn't even get a thank you for stopping by letter. <laughs> that was crazy. What am I getting at? Don't worry about anything. Listen to, the, listen to the Amplified Classic. It says, do not fret or have any anxiety about anything. Now, I'm here to help you. I'm not here to be judgmental at all. I love you. God loves you. Any anxiety about anything. And I just heard in my spirit, <laughs> Pastor, I'm not asking for the anxiety. I can't help the anxiety. And I'm here just to encourage you that your soul has hope. And your soul can be anchored in Christ. Now I'm going to teach you, just a few more minutes before I close, how to do this. Do not fret or have any anxiety about anything, but in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition. Definite request, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. Listen, the place of rest available to believers is a real place. I understand the, the, the nature of your, uh, 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 the carnal nature of the flesh is to, is to worry, is to stress, uh, be anxious about things, cares, but the nature of your spirit is to live at rest. You see this in the beginning, Adam and Eve. They walked and talked with God in the cool of the day of the garden. But when sin came in, now all of a sudden God comes and they run and hide. Why? They're worried. Now, go with me to 1 Peter 5, 7. And I'm going to show you this here. I'll try to wrap up. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7. He says here, <clears throat> he says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Let's read it together. Ready? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. All right, now let me show you the new living. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for about you. Does he care about you? Yes. Okay. Amplified. Classic edition. Casting the whole of your care. All, all your anxieties. What are we doing? We're casting them. All your anxiety all your worries, all your concerns, concerns? You know what concerns are? They're a pretty wrapped up package of anxiety. Well, I'm just concerned. This is a nicer sounding word, isn't it? All it is is an anxiety wrapped up in paper with a little bow on it. It's still anxiety if you open it up. Well, I'm just concerned about my children. Just concerned about this. All your worries, all your concerns, look at this now. Once and for all on him. Casting it. Casting them. 
For he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. How do we cast our cares upon the Lord? Well, on Thursdays, if you haven't been here, I really recommend you go back and listen to the Thursday evenings because I'm teaching the very spirit of faith. In the spirit of faith, we're talking about the fundamentals of faith. The fundamentals of faith are believing and speaking. And it's exactly what David did. Paul, he describes what we do is we believe and we speak. And he says, as it is written, how David believed and spoke. When David faced Goliath, he didn't do it with his mouth closed. And you don't face your problems, anxieties, with your mouth closed. That's exactly what the enemy does. Goliath was running his mouth. And you are supposed to open your mouth. But when you open your mouth, you speak words of faith. You speak words of life out of your mouth. And this is how we cast the care over upon him. And so when the care comes, the concern comes, when the anxiety tries to come, you've got to open your mouth. And you've got to say, nope, I cast the care of that over upon you, Lord, because you care for me. And I'm going to do it once and for all. And guess what? The care comes knocking again. I guarantee it. And you go to the door and go, I'm not in here. <laughs> Don't open the door for it. You sense that coming back? Say, no, nope, I cast that care over upon the Lord. I just thank you, Lord. See, what am I doing? I'm praying. I'm making my request known unto God with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord. Once I pray, once I pray, that's the casting. And then any time it comes back, you just go into thanksgiving mode. Thank you, Lord. I'm free from the care of that. Thank you, Lord. And you can even, maybe you can sense it physically. Maybe the anxiety is something that causes a physical a reaction in your body. And you just begin to sense that physical reaction just a little bit. You say, no, I thank you, Lord, that my trust, my anchor of my soul is in the Lord. And I trust you with all my heart, all my mind, all my soul, all my being. I'm not taking that care again ever in my life. I cast it over on him. It's gone forever and ever and ever. Five minutes goes by, you sense it again. Guess what you do? Shift it right back in the gear. Nope, thank you, Lord. I cast that care over upon you. You care for me. I refuse to take that. I'm not picking it up. I'm not touching it. It's not my care. I'm not worried about my finances. I'm not worried about my kids. I'm not worried about my health. I casted that care over upon you. And you do it. Well, how many times do I have to do it? As many times as it comes knocking, you start talking. You cannot fight the good fight of faith with your mouth closed. You've got to open your mouth. David opened his mouth. And Joshua and Caleb, they didn't just stand there and go, man, I, man, I still feel... Looking at you, know, I can see Joshua and Caleb. Didn't God tell us we could go in there? Yeah, he did. He did. He did. Well, I don't know. These other ten say we can't go in. Yeah, you're right. I guess we'll just stay out here and wait with them. He goes, wait, 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 wait. He stilled the people. That means it was an uprising beginning. He stilled the people. Hey, we'll be well able to go up at once and overcome it. Guess who went in? The two that spoke up. You got to speak up. Because your giant is talking to you. And you got to talk back to him. You got to say unto the mountain. And I know this isn't popular. I know this isn't like people. Are, you're going to think you're weird when you first do it. But who cares? You're going to hear yourself saying this for the very first time, and you're going to go, oh, this sounds so ridiculous. And the devil's right there, and he'll go, oh, man, you know that doesn't really work. And you go back to the Scripture, and you, again, that's why Thursday would be really important for you to hear saying and believing. Saying and believing. Saying and believing. Casting the whole of your care, all your anxiety, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all, on him. Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Praise God.
Praise God. Well, I hope you learned something there. Again, I'm not trying to be hard, hard or harsh on anybody that's, you know, maybe you're, you're dealing with uh, anxiety and cares, and uh, we certainly will, will pray for you in this church, but I've got to equip you so that when you leave here, you know how to deal with the enemy. You know how to, how to deal with these things that bombard your mind. And there is a rest for God's people, and that time is now. Amen? And I think that, you know, a, a lot of us in the room probably, uh, you know, I venture to say, uh, have maybe different levels, if you will, of, of dealing with this stuff, right? But we can't. We got we to gotta know we're equipped to deal with this stuff. Praise God. And live victorious Christian life through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you for your word. It is powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder, soul from spirit like bone from marrow. And it went into our heart and into our life through your word, and it penetrated those areas that we needed penetration, Lord, so that we can see and know and understand how to fight the good fight of faith and how to enter into your rest. There's a rest for God's people. There's a rest for every one of us in this room. And I thank you, Lord, that our believing and our faith were just so effortlessly entering in to your rest. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. We just simply believe and we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we always want to give people that opportunity. So if you're in this room and uh, you haven't made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, as I dismiss, I want to give you that opportunity to come out of your seat. These people will be up here at the altar to pray with you. If you'd like prayer in any other area of your life, at this church, we are absolutely not afraid to believe God for a miracle in your life. Amen? So if you'd like prayer in any area of your life, or maybe you know somebody, and you say, hey, I, I know somebody needs prayer, and I'm going to come up here and like you to pray with me and join my faith with, with you. So that's you. As I dismiss, come out of here. Come, come out of your seat and come up here. Remember that you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Bless going in, bless going out. Everything you set your hand to, you're the lender, not the borrower. You're good looking. You're dismissed. God bless you.